Like, give it a few seconds and then go down the main menu. And we'll go in. And you can move him in. Unfortunately, if he moves much, he's probably not going to have him on today. You can talk with him. Uh, do you want me to get mostly him or a little bit of the audience? Okay. Mostly just him. Okay. Understood. Some of these, like Snowden and some of the other ones, involved an insider 
that actually is part of the organization, has legitimate access to data, and suddenly all, suddenly all that data is gone. On the other hand, a lot of these involve threats, insider threats, but an outsider has stolen and uh, taken those legitimate credentials to use for their own nefarious means. Sony's a good example of that, right? Sony's an example of attackers coming in from the outside, but the threat to the data was already there because data was overexposed, they weren't doing any kind of monitoring, they had credentials sitting on open file servers, the, the, the threat to their data was inside. Second, it's unstructured data that's getting stolen, right? Nobody's breaking into a bank to steal the pens. The people that are trying to get inside your network or your insiders that you're worried about inside the network already, they're not taking router logs, they're not taking application logs. Uh, they're, in some cases, they're trying to take databases, but it's the unstructured data. That's how your information, that's how your, your assets become portable. They end up in files, they end up in spreadsheets, they end up in presentations or documents. Yes, you're going to have patient records or transactional records that uh, exist in databases that you absolutely want to protect and need to protect, but the data that you have the most of, that you probably know the least about, is unstructured data, right? It's the stuff on the cloud servers. And then finally, traditional approaches haven't worked. I think uh, Verizon has the statistic that 87% of security spend in the last few years has been at the perimeter. You guys probably are spending lots of time and money and energy securing the perimeter of your network, right? But what we're seeing is that a lot of organizations have a security model that's kind of like a candy bar. The perimeter is very hard and solid, but the inside, once somebody's inside, or if they're an insider, they're already there, the security on the data or the assets themselves is relatively soft. So hard outer shell, nice soft interior, it's kind of like a candy bar, we call that the candy bar defense. 87% of spending has been on the perimeter, and those security controls haven't worked when it comes to these uh, big breaches. The impact of these breaches is significant and it's growing. Most organizations see, on average, about one attack per quarter, right? And even if they get breached, it's 270 some odd days before they realize that it actually happens. That comes from Verizon as well. Almost half of us don't even know if, we'd some, if we've suffered some sort of insider breach. This is everything from people exfiltrating data to a ransomware attack, right? And more than a third of us estimate that these costs are more than a million dollars. And it's not just the recovery costs, it's not just the technology costs, it's the reputational damage, and these kind of issues tend to have C-level or board-level visibility right now. These aren't just IT issues. This isn't your help desk that's sitting around trying to figure out how to stop data breaches. This goes right to your board, right? All right. The last thing I want to talk about before I start telling you how we're, we have our approach to solving this problem is that the specific problems we're talking about, again, aren't IT problems. They're really CEO problems. Knowing what did Bob have access to before he left? Did he, did, he, did he access anything that he shouldn't have? Do I have sensitive information like PII in widely accessible folders? Do I have sensitive data that's open to lots and lots of people? And even if I did, do I have any way to fix that? Why do we keep getting into this ransomware? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because I've been asking that question for about 12 months now and everybody kind of nods their heads but nobody wants to raise their hand and say they've gotten hit by ransomware. You guys may be experiencing that. I'm not going to make any assumptions. What data can we get rid of? We have a huge amount of data. How many of you have more data this year than you had last year? Every hand is probably going to go up if you think about it. You're going to have more next year, too. What data can we get rid of? If we have a retention or disposition policy, how do we apply that, especially when it comes to unstructured data? And then where did everything go? Who had access? What did they do with it? You can't manage what you don't monitor. If we're not monitoring unstructured data. It's really, really difficult to answer all of these questions. And I bet if this was a workshop, we could go around and you guys could start at, at brainstorming some other questions about your data that are probably important that you might not be able to answer. So, from a, 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 an attack perspective, it's really easy to get inside the network, right? Employees make mistakes. They click on things they shouldn't. They access data they shouldn't. They probably have access to data, too much data. They have access to data that they don't need anymore because they're on a project or their role changed or what have you. And employees make mistakes. This comes from Verizon as well. 23% of phishing emails get opened, and more than 1 in 10 of those open emails get clicked on. That's a terrifying statistic from a security perspective, right? And I'm sure, I think there are, there are, there are organizations out here that will help you with end user training. You need to make sure that your users understand security, and you have defense in depth, and, and they understand what it takes to properly protect organizational data, but all, it almost doesn't matter. It's very easy to get inside the network if you have a determined attacker. But then we also have to worry about rogue employees, people that are already inside the network. Admins using their credentials to poke around. Maybe not maliciously, just to see what they can see, right? Uh, service accounts that might stop behaving like service accounts. Users that get hit with malware or get hijacked, have their credentials hijacked. You know, people making mistakes or just disgruntled employees. 
right? It's happened at almost every organization. Somebody decides to go to a competitor, grabs everything they've ever worked on, or they walk out the door, right? These are the kinds of vectors that you need to worry about from a security perspective. And think about, if, if you were hit with any, any, any one of these kinds of attacks today on your unstructured data, you know about it. Many of the customers that we talk to or the organizations that we talk to, the answer there is no. So, I hope you all agree that there's a threat here, right? But how do we stop people that are inside or determined attackers from the outside leveraging inside credentials? That's what I want to talk about today. I'm not going to get into the weeds in technology or features and functionality. I certainly can if you want to raise your hand and ask some questions. But what I really want to talk about is a high-level approach that Veronis has seen work for our thousands of customers and thousands of other organizations. This is how we think about unstructured data protection and a methodology for kind of uh, protecting your data, not just now, but over time. The first thing, and the thing that's most key, that's most important, is you need to understand your data. You need to have information about your data. We call that metadata. It's data about data. And specifically, when it comes to your files, to the stuff that's on NAS devices, and SharePoint, and Exchange, and uh, even Office 365, when it comes to your file data, here are the kinds of metadata that you actually need. First, User group information. You have an identity store, both an Active Directory, maybe other directory services like LDAP if you're using them, but then also local accounts, both on the file servers and in SharePoint and Exchange. Those are identities. You've got user objects, you've got service account objects, you've got group objects, and all, there's all of the relationships between them. We go out and gather that identity store. Second, are there permissions information? If you've ever looked at a Windows file server or a big NAS device, you know you're talking about hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of folders and then millions upon millions of files, you need to understand the potential access to all that data. An access control list is usually just a list of groups that have access, but if you go out to your identity store and map all of that, and then go out to your permissions and map all of that, you understand potential access. You understand how people are getting access to data. Not all files are created equal. They're down there on the bottom right. You need to understand and interrogate the content of your data, right? What represents more risk to your organization? a payroll file on a SharePoint site that's open to everybody, or someone's iTunes library that's in their person drive? The answer is probably the former, but you're never really going to know that unless you understand access and understand the content. And then I said it once, and I'm probably going to say it half a dozen times uh, throughout the course of this presentation today, so please bear with me. But you can't manage what you don't monitor. And when we're talking about attacks, especially insider attacks, you can't catch what you can't see. So if you're not monitoring how people behave, and you're not monitoring, looking at actual access to that data, actual file level activity, very difficult to catch these, even if you're very determined to do it. So that's the metadata that you generally need. If you were to be able to go out and gather this metadata on a regular basis, on a continuous basis, and do it without impacting your environment, now we can start to see some of the ways that we can protect data and keep it protected over time. The methodology that I'm going to take you through today uh, is what we consider our operational plan, but it's really a data protection methodology. And it's got three easy phases that we color coded here. First is you've got to detect. You've got to turn on the lights. One of the reasons you guys and lots and almost every other organization out there that has data, which is pretty much everybody, can't, and, and reason that people can't protect this data is that you haven't turned on the lights. Imagine trying to clean up your garage in the dark. That's often what we're doing when it comes to unstructured data. You don't have any of this metadata. So the first thing you need to do is map your environment, turn on. Hi, folks. I'm Geek here. Sorry, but we had a very small glitch, and audio should resume in a few seconds. changes now. If I've got lots of information, especially information that's sensitive, that's open to lots and lots of people, that's probably the first change that I want to make. IT risk is a function really of two factors. It's the value of an asset multiplied by the probability of its loss. When we're talking about unstructured data, we're talking about the sensitivity of the files and the number of people who have access to it. Right? Remember that example about the payroll file and SharePoint site? Risk is what, how sensitive is something and how many people have access to it. So you want to find out where you've got really valuable assets and start reducing the number of people who have access. Right? We want to lock that data down right away. We also want to get rid of global access in general. And I, you can probably come up with a couple of scenarios where it makes sense. But in general, you don't want data open to everybody in the company, especially not open to everybody. 
if you've got older Windows file servers, you've got this lovely little object called the Everyone Group. Somebody plugs into your network. They don't even have to authenticate. If they're plugged into the network, they can access that data. Right? Even if they authenticate, now they can access all the data that's open to domain users and authenticated users. So you need to eliminate global access. But why haven't you done it before now? Well, first of all, you probably don't know all the data that's open globally. Second of all, and maybe most importantly, you probably don't have a good way of fixing it. Right? What happens when you remove that global access group? All the people that are using that group to access data, all of the service accounts and applications, all of the departmental users, all of your business users, suddenly can't access the asset that they need. So if you're going to do this, and I highly recommend you do, do it in a way that minimizes risk, that helps you make change without disrupting anything. Right? So you should be able to understand who actually is accessing data, who should have access to this data, so that when you remove the global access group, you do so safely. And the people who continue to need access, including service accounts, maintain that access. You don't break anyway. That same boss uh, who gave me advice when I was on the help desk uh, gave me another great piece of advice that I'd like to tell when I talk about eliminating global access. He said, Brian, uh, you're a smart guy, but be really careful when you try to fix something. The fastest way to get fired in IT is to try to fix something. Because you have absolutely no idea what you're going to bring. Right? This is a great example of that. Unless you know and you have a mechanism in place for understanding the impact of making this kind of change, very difficult to do. Which is why, if you, if you guys aren't Vernal's customers and you haven't gone through this kind of plan, you may still have a lot of data open globally. But I'm here to tell you there are ways to do this safely. So we want to lock down access. We want to eliminate uh, lock down sensitive data. We want to eliminate global access. Get rid of the low hanging fruit. And then we want to simplify our permission structure. This is about putting a sustainable model for preventive controls in place, which is a really convoluted way of saying you want to make sure that the right people have access to the right data, right? But you also want to make sure that you're managing access and permissions appropriately. If you think about a Windows file system tree, the right way to manage access is to manage near the top of the tree, right? You want either at the very top or at the most, one or two levels down, those are your departmental shares, your team shares, your personal drives, what have you, and that's where you control access. The problem is when you don't do that, if you let access controls be broken all the way down the tree, it becomes impossible to identify where they are and to really make changes. If you start, if you start changing preventive controls and changing access and reducing access to the top of the tree, if there are broken inheritance really far down, you're actually not making any changes to any of that data. You want to make sure that your permissions are simplified and managed as high up as possible. And when I say managing permissions, the idea should be that you have a single purpose group. If I put someone in an, in, in an AD group to give them access to this data, that's all it should do. It shouldn't give them access to three other data sets and two other applications. Right? You want to make sure you're using single purpose groups, ideally a regroup and a modify group, and it's towards the top of the tree. Now this isn't something generally you can push a button to do. This is something that you're going to want to sit down and think about. What do our permission structures look like now? What do we want them to, how do, you know, what do we want them to look like in the future and how do we get them there? being able to simulate access control changes, monitoring how data is being used, getting rid of all the stale data, tends to reduce the amount of time and effort it takes to simplify your permissions. But this is generally the model you're going to want to get to if you want to get to a sustainable model where your data is uh, monitored and properly controlled. You also want to eliminate excessive access. Here's what I mean by this. Pick a user, any user in your head. Ideally not an, uh, an admin user, but pick any business user in your organization. Do you know every single AD group that they're a part of? Probably. You can probably figure that out. Do you know all of the data that they have access to? Probably not. That's a really difficult question to answer. It can even be an archaeology project. Now, the follow-up to that is, does that person, does he or she have access to data that he or she doesn't need to have access to anymore? And the answer, I will bet money, the answer is yes. Again, our roles change, we're on projects, people's access get cloned, right? There's all sorts of ways that we get access to data. And that first job, I'm going to go back to my history again, work to help desk, people will call up all the time. I need access to this share, I need access to this folder, I'm on this project, I need access to this. My boss says I need access to this to do my job. People will scream and yell until they get the access that they need to do their jobs. Worked at help desk for five years, not once did anybody ever call me up screaming saying, Brian, I have access to too much data. I'm in too many groups, and if you don't remove me from them, I'm going to have your head on the platter. Never happened once. Right? But you need to figure out where people have access to stuff that they don't need. Right? When we talk about the right people having access to the right data, part of that 
is making sure that your insiders, your actual users, don't have access to a whole bunch of data and a whole bunch of systems that they don't need access to. Well, if we're looking at how people behave, if we're looking at the actual data that they access, we should be able to figure out the data that they don't need access to. If I'm in a group, and that group gives me access to a bunch of data, and I'm not using anything that that group gives me access to, and in fact, I'll behave like all of the other peers in that group, we should be able to highlight that. We should be able to understand where people have access to data that they don't need. But the only way to do that is to understand all potential access and to monitor actual behavior. So, we turn on the lights, but now we've actually started to make changes to our environment. We're making changes from a security perspective without disrupting anybody, right? We want to lock down our most sensitive data, get rid of global access, simplify permissions, right? We want to prune unnecessary access. If people are in groups that they don't need, they should be pulled out. We should get rid of all the low hanging fruit in Active Directory and on the file system. And we want to start, by the way, identifying data owners. That's going to come into play when we get to the final stage here, sustain. Turn on the lights didn't take a lot of work. Might take some technology and tooling, but it didn't take a lot of work. We had detection controls. Putting preventive controls in place, that takes a little bit of work. That takes a little bit of engagement with your business. That, start, that means you're starting to make changes to access control. You want to do that safely. But that's not something generally you push a button and do. There's generally a project involved there. Finally, you want to sustain this over time. You want to make sure that your people, your process, and your technology all work together to make sure that your data is secured and that it's monitored and that people only have access to what they're supposed to. And that means that it's not just a one-time project. You also want to make sure that you have the right processes in place to keep this sustained over time. So, the first thing that we want to do is identify our data owners. The people who should be making decisions about access, about who should have access to this financial record and who shouldn't have access to these HR files and who should have access to this departmental share and who shouldn't have access to something in IT, those aren't necessarily the guys running the help desk, like me in my old job. It's not even the person who's, who manages who's ever making the request, right? It's a data owner. You need people outside of IT, outside of security, who have the right context, who can actually make these decisions, who understand the data, understand the business, understand who should and shouldn't have access. Have you ever tried to identify a data owner? It's a nightmare, right? On average, and this is, I've seen this, Gartner says this, IBC says this, on average, it takes six to eight hours to identify a data owner for a single folder. Because you're looking at file names, you're looking at permissions, but permissions, there's five groups that have access to this folder, or it's open to everybody, who do I go to? And then once you, you dig into the content and you figure out what department it is, you, you take it to that department and they tell you, I don't know what this is. I don't want to have anything to do with this. Right? Has that ever happened to anybody? I know it's happened to me before. But once you start monitoring how people behave, it's amazing how easy it is to find your data owners. When you can go to somebody and say, yeah, I know you don't want to be the data owner here, you may not know what this is, but every single person that's touching this file works for you. So you're the owner, we're going to start figuring out how to put the, the right security controls in place. Once you monitor how people behave, very straightforward to figure out who the data belongs to. If it's not your most active user, 99 times out of 100, it's that user's manager. <coughs> or they're going to know. You're one phone call away. Once you identify your owners, though, you need to start giving them the ability to make decisions. The first thing that you want to do is make sure that when somebody needs access to something, it's the data owner, not the help desk, not that person's boss, that actually makes the decision. Yes or no? Should Brian have access to this or not? And ideally, you want to automate that. If I need access to something, I go to a mechanism, a web page, or a portal or something, and I say, I want access to this data. That request gets routed to the data owner or multiple data owners. Maybe you have an authorization workflow. Data owner says yes or no. If they say yes, I get the access. If they say yes, but only for a certain period of time, it should automatically be taken away. Think about the process that you've just now put in place. Not only do the right people have access to the data, but the data owner is making a decision about who should and shouldn't have access. And when you, if you've got monitoring in place, Think about the audit record you have now. You know that Brian asked for access on this day. Here's why he needed it. Here's what he said he needed it for. Here's who approved it, why they approved it, when they approved it. And because you've got a monitoring control in place, here's everything that, that Brian did while he had that access. Imagine how much more secure you'd be from an accountability perspective just having that audit record. Excuse me. Picked up a cold on my last trip. Apologize. It's not just the authorization workflow that you want owners involved in, though, right? You want them reviewing access on a regular basis. Let's go back to our friend Elon Musk, I guess, who has access to data but probably doesn't need it anymore based on his behavior, right? We can automatically identify that and maybe pull him out. But imagine a better scenario. Once we've identified our owners, once a quarter, once a year, once every six months, whatever, whatever it is for your, based on your policy, 
Typically, we see it once a quarter. The owner goes and reviews who has access to their data. Now imagine how actionable that information is about this guy who isn't behaving like he's in your group anymore. It's not something in IT or security that's reviewing that access. I'm a data owner. I'm looking at the people who have access to my data, and this guy's flagged because he doesn't look like he belongs in my group anymore based on his behavior. That's among the most actionable things you can give to a data owner. But to get that far, you need to simplify your permissions, identify your owners, and then put a mechanism in place for this to happen. This tends not to happen overnight. But then, as a data owner, you review access, you pull that person out, and now you're inherently more secure because somebody with the right context, somebody who understands data, understands their team, understands their business, hopefully, or your business, I should say, is making a decision about who should, should, should and shouldn't have access, and you're giving that person information about behavior, about all of the detection controls that you have in place that make their job, make that review job even easier. Once you have metadata in place, you're constantly gathering all this information, there's also a bunch of stuff that you can automate, right? All of you, are, actually, I would say if I had to guess, probably two-thirds of the people in this room work for an organization that has a retention and disposition policy for data. If I also had to guess, of those two-thirds that actually have a policy defined, I bet it's less, unless you're a Verona's customer, I bet it's less than a quarter that are actually applying your retention policies to unstructured data. It is notoriously difficult to do. We tend not to delete anything. We keep it forever, just in case. Because you'd rather not delete something that you need down the line than delete something that you know, legal comes to you and says, hey, what happened to that data? So we have retention policies, but once we actually understand behavior and we understand content and we understand permissions and ownership, we can actually put our retention policies in place and automate the deletion, archiving, disposal of data. We can automate quarantining. If I save a spreadsheet that's got a bunch of patient records in my personal drive, that's the wrong place for that data. It doesn't mean that I'm doing something malicious, right? But that's probably the wrong place for my data. It probably breaks the policies that you guys are working so hard to put in place. When I save it, if I'm monitoring behavior and content, a system should automatically identify. If something sensitive went in the wrong place, move it. Leave a file behind that says, hey, this was put in the wrong place, it was moved because of this reason. That's the kind of thing, the automating of quarantining, automating of retention, automating of disposition, automating of migrations and consolidations. Once you have metadata and you've got the system that can actually analyze it, these are the kinds of things that you can actually automate. And that's how you're going to sustain over time, right? You're not going to go through a cleanup project every other year. I hope you're not, because that would suck. Uh, and I've been part of these the cleanup projects before, especially before the advent of this kind of metadata and monitoring. But once you have all this metadata, think of all the things that you can automate. Think how much easier your life will be. Think how much more secure you'll be if the policies you have in place to protect data actually get enacted on the data that they were designed to protect. So we turn on the lights. We put good preventive controls in place. We've gotten rid of the really bad preventive controls, the global access, the overexposed sensitive data. And now, once we identify our owners and we get them involved, and once we put automation in place, now we can sustain this over time. So think about the model that you've got now. You're actually monitoring and you're protecting your data from the inside out. This is the opposite of that candy bar defense. I'm not saying, by the way, get rid of your firewall. I'm not saying get rid of your perimeter. I'm not saying get rid of your endpoint monitoring. I'm not saying get rid of identity management or data loss prevention or any of the other controls and technologies that you've got in place. What I am saying is that if you decide that protecting unstructured data, you decide that protecting your data is important, and we're hearing more and more that it is becoming a critical critical to data security to protect unstructured data, you need to protect it from the inside out. So let's think about where we are now. We've turned on the lights, we've detected, we put detective controls in place, we understand potential access, we understand who's got access to what, we understand if I put someone in this group, here's what's going to grant them access to, we, under, we know who our users are, we know who our service accounts are, we know who our admin accounts are, and we're baselining all behavior. Now we've put preventive controls in place. We've gotten rid of global access. We've gotten rid of overexposed sensitive data, or we've just put a good, you know, a, a good type control on. We continue to behavior monitor, and we remove all of the dangerous artifacts, all of the all, all of the uh, low hanging fruit from Active Directory and the file systems. And then finally, we have identified owners. We've automated what we can, and we have owners involved in the authorization workflow, owners involved in the entitlement review process, and we've got good accountability controls, not just for how data is being used, but how people are getting access to that data, and who's approving it, when they approved it, and all of the other audit records that you want if you're going to make sure that your assets were properly secure. I guarantee you, by the way, if you pick another business-critical asset, like, for instance, the cash accounts that your finance, finance department manages, 
they've got all of these controls in place. They know exactly who's got access to that bank account. They know exactly how it's being used and by who. And they've got budget owners that are reviewing access on a regular basis. If you want to treat your data like an organizational asset, like a business asset, and not like a server or a piece of network equipment or the workstation or anything else, if you want to treat the data like a business asset, these are the kinds of controls that you need to have in place. Because if you don't have them, we end up with a chaotic environment. And this is none of you guys, because you guys are all super smart. But we end up with environments where Active Directory is a complete mess. We don't know how many users, how many groups we have. We don't know where they grant access. We don't know what data is out there or how it's being used. We don't even know, in some cases, how much data we have. All of these are issues that we hear a lot from organizations that have a lot of unstructured data. But once we help them walk through this methodology, they get to a state that they can sustain over time and they can start focusing on other things. I'm completely blown away every time I get to this slide. But as it turns out, everything I've talked about now is something that Veronis can actually do. Uh, again, complete coincidence, but if you'd like to learn more, about what this would look like in your environment. If you'd like to do a risk assessment and actually turn on the lights in your environment on one server, on one platform, maybe in, in your entire environment, we do a free risk assessment. And we really walk through that whole detect phase on whatever data you want us to look at. We'll map all of the sensitive data. We'll go out to Active Directory. We'll, we'll map back to the file systems themselves. We'll show you all the potential access. And we'll create a big report that says, you know what? Here's how many folders you have that have sensitive data. Here's how many of those that are open globally. Here's how many. Uh, you know, threats that were detected while we were monitoring data. Here's how all the stale data we found. Everything that I talked about in the detect phase, we can show you over the course of this risk assessment. And then we can walk you through, here's what it would take to put preventive controls in place. Here's what it would take to sustain this over time. We can even help you do that on a subset of your data. This, by the way, is completely free of charge. If this is something that you'd like to see, uh, please come talk to us. Yeah? Uh, if I were to run that on my uh, network, what permissions would I need to be able to have that go and check everything? That's could, a great. Could random Joe Schmo use that and plug in my network? That's a really great question. Um, and for those of you that didn't hear, the question was: If you were to run this risk assessment on your network, what kind of credentials would you need? And could anybody do this? So the answer is no. Anybody could not do this. This is 100 percent on premises. You need to install us. We, we, we help you spin it up. Uh, you give us a window. It's it's software based. So you give us a Windows and a SQL Server. We spin it up. And then as far as credentials. We need a domain user to bind to whatever domains you're going to walk. We need a user that's got backup operator and power user for the file systems, analogous permissions for SharePoint Exchange, right? So it's going to depend on what platforms you want to look at and what you actually want to monitor. But we've, we've got this down to the science. We've done this thousands and thousands of times. But no, nobody randomly can decide, I want to do a risk assessment on Bill's environment just to see what I can find. That, that, that doesn't work that way. Great question, though. Yeah, another question. If any of the data you're analyzing in that threat assessment leave the building? I, it, absolutely not. So the question is, does any data in this threat assessment ever leave the building? The answer is all the data that we produce during the threat assessment belongs to you. Uh, this is a 100% on-premises solution. So none of, the none of the metadata analysis or any data at all ever ends up in any hands or in any systems that aren't controlled by you. And what we do with it, I mean, we will help you prepare this, this, this document, this artifact, but we give it to you and we don't use it anywhere else. That's a good question. In other words, you're not using big databases out there in California somewhere to help you do this. Right. Absolutely not. Everything, all the analysis, everything that we do is in your environment and the systems that you spin up. Yeah. Uh, we're talking an app, uh, So the question is, are we talking an app or a virtual appliance or what have you? So it runs on a, an application server cluster that runs on Windows and SQL. Generally, there's also a not generally. We always have a distributed or tiered collection uh, network. So, for instance, in a very simple uh, installation, we would have an application server that runs on Windows and SQL. We also have a collector server that sits physically close to the file server, SharePoint, what have you. Each one of those collectors, by the way, can support 50 to 100 file servers. So it's not like you need to spin up one for every, every box. Generally, during this risk assessment period, you give us one or two VMs, and we spin everything up and start running it. Um, as far as a production deployment, I mean, we've got customers that have hundreds of thousands of users and petabytes of data. Certainly, you're talking about a bigger distributed collection framework, but still, it's all controlled by them. And because everything's Windows and SQL, it takes us, the company line is, this takes 90 minutes to spin up. In general, let's say two to three hours to get it up and running, and then a day to see all of the detect controls. To turn on monitoring, map the environment, scan for sensitive data, and then we start preparing this report. While we're baselining a user activity, by the way, a lot of the more advanced threat models, as we call them, the admins not behaving like admins, um, some of the really advanced ransomware detection, service account uh, monitoring, abnormal access to stale and sensitive data, 
That typically takes three to four weeks of behavior before those threat models will stop throwing false positives. We need to see activity so that we know what's normal, so that we alert you when something's abnormal, it actually is. Some of the threat models, by the way, are really valid right from day one. Some of the uh, more rudimentary or threshold-based ransomware detection, encrypting lots of files in a short period of time, uh, data exfiltration on stale or sensitive data, those will light up and start working as they're supposed to right away. Some of the more advanced ones take a few weeks of user activity bake-in time. Um, you're not doing any tuning, by the way. Sometimes I say bake-in time or um, analytic period, and people who maybe you've done a behavior analytics project in the past, you start saying, well, now I'm going to be up all night tuning rules. Everything is, all the machine learning analysis we do is totally under the hood. Everything is just out of the box. You just light up the, uh, the alert threat models, and, you're good to go. <coughs> and all of those are available as part of the risk assessment. Yeah. Yeah, um, we've got a uh, number of different locations, and how does that, you know, how does that work? Do you have to do that, uh, you know, per each, or, you know, can you, you know, can you go ahead and branch out and get everything? So, great question for those of you in the back feed in here. What if I've got multiple locations? Um, the answer is you, you'll, have a, you'll have that single um, application server or cluster if it's a really big environment, and then you'll have those collectors physically close to those, uh, in each of those locations. Because those collectors are gathering what, potentially a huge amount of information from the big net app or the Isilon or the file servers of SharePoint. Um, we've got one of our biggest customers has uh, net, you know, net apps in 12 different data centers, and each net app has about 50 million file events a day. So we have a collector close to each one of those net apps. They do all the pre processing <laughs> and then send it back to the application server, which is where all the analysis, some of the alerting, and all the reporting and everything else is done. Great question, though. As you can imagine, a lot of your questions, the smart crowd, you guys are realizing this is a huge amount of metadata. This isn't something that I'm going to drop my iPhone on your network and suddenly you're going to know everything. You need to have some sort of infrastructure to gather it. But the ability to gather, process, analyze, and then present all of this metadata in ways that are really useful and actionable is literally what Veronis was designed to do. The reason I tell that Veronis origin story at the beginning is to give you an idea that our founders, first of all, they were engineers and technologists. They've lived with these problems before. And everything that I've shown you, at least from a Verona's perspective, we built ourselves. We developed all of our technology because we realized the tools in place, the tools that existed, and even some of the repurposing of other tools that you might use to attack this problem in various ways simply weren't sufficient because of the huge amount of uh, metadata that you do need to gather. But we do this without impacting your environment at all, and we'd like to prove it to you, and that's part of what the risk assessment does. It'll show you how we collect everything, how this analysis works, and it'll also prove to you, hopefully, that it doesn't impact your environment at all. We've got about 5,000 customers globally now. We've added you know, 1,200 from the last year, so we're having lots of success. But you know, what I want to impress upon you now is if you think this might be valuable, I encourage you to do the risk assessment only because you get a, a, a complete, uh, you know, a full license of all of our software. You get our help setting it up and using it, and we produce this risk assessment for you completely for free. And this, this doesn't require any uh, licensing or services time to do. And so you can get a lot of value out of it. Yeah? Do you have any metrics on the impact of the walk or the crawl? And also, the second question, do you have, are there any limitations for the type of, of servers that are posted? So, any hardware or software or application? Yeah, so two questions. Any metrics <laughs> about the impact of the environment? Um, I'll start with that one. So generally on a file, so, so for Windows, SharePoint, Unix, and Exchange, we have uh, agents that sit on the file server to gather the activity specifically. Um, we never write to disk on any platform on any server that we monitor, and that's true across any platform. There's never an I.O. overhead. For the agents, it's about 6 to 10 megs of RAM, 0 to 1% CPU, um, and again, we never write to disk. So it's very low weight. It sits at the kernel level on Windows, and there's an it sits in, in an analogous place on SharePoint, Unix, and Exchange. Um, as far as what was the second half of your question? Actually, there's, there's a second half to the first part of your question. Um, on, in our database, it takes about half a gig per thousand users per month to gather that information. So it's really, really small from a data storage perspective. Most of our customers will keep six to 12 months of hot uh, activity data, another two to three years of rolled up statistics. Everything else is automatically archived off, archived off but it's very easy to suck that back in for running a report or doing some sort of forensic analysis. Right. So it generally doesn't break the bank at all at the data center or on the network. Yeah. And I now I apologize. What was the Windows file share? Yeah. Right. So any of the other yeah, things? this is the best way to do this is take a look at our install requirements document. We go back to basically Windows 2008. Uh, we can we have some older servers that we'll monitor. SharePoint it goes back all the way. 
um, exchange, I think goes back to 2007. Um, and then the NAS devices are going to depend on the specific, like for NetApp, the specific ONTAP version. For Celera, it's going to depend on the Kepler Kava version and, and Isilon, similar kinds of things. It really depends on the specific platform. That said, Veronis has been around since 2000, we were founded in 2005, started in 2006, and we generally have supported everything that was common from 2006 and on. It's generally, when we start monitoring a platform, it's exceedingly rare for us to drop support for monitoring that platform, just because data just tends to live there and it makes sense to monitor. Does that answer your question? Sure. Any other questions? Look at that. You guys are going to get three whole minutes back in your day. I hope you appreciate what I've done for you today. No, I thank you all so much. Has this been useful for you guys?